check one, two, one, two to the beat, yo. What's up? It's Eric Marcotte, the OEM Sessions. Today, we are sitting down with Anna Sparks. She is a, she's got a master's in exercise physiology. She's got an undergrad bachelor's in exercise science. She raced professionally cycling for, I don't know, half a decade, five, six years. Uh, before that, she was coaching uh, elite or college level soccer. She was playing it herself. She was coaching uh, strength and condition coach. Like we go through it. Like, you know, I, I love to go through the background of these people and where they've had their experience in life and insight on who they are and what drives them and why they've continued on with specific um, things. Like we get laid into uh, what she's doing now, which is she's got Spark Systems, which is basically coaching, nutrition, um, and we really get into the metabolic testing or like most most of the people that are listening to this stuff would recognize it as like a VO2 max test. Uh, but there's other numbers, there's other important information that also can be found in those tests, and we really go through a lot of that and how she's applying it to the athletes or people who are coming in to increase their performance. And then also getting into clinics now where you're having the average American come in with diagnosis of uh, type 2 diabetes, atherosclerosis, etc. And you're putting them on these tests and you're seeing the metabolic efficiency or inefficiency and you're helping them, helping guide them with the nutrition protocol and exercise protocol and you know months later you retest and you can man- manipulate those numbers which ultimately means you've manipulated their physiology so for both settings for us that are looking for high level performance this stuff is really cool really insightful on what's happening with your body as we talk about you can look good physically um, you may have aerobically the capacity to go for a while, but there may be some things that you're doing to sabotage yourself in the long run. And we give some examples of that. And, um, and then we can look at how can we apply that stuff for everybody out there just living. And how can we take the information that we get at the high level of physiology and fitness and trickle it down to help um everybody live a healthier happier life so i think you're really going to like this one she's a sweetheart southern gal you hear the little accent there and um enjoy anna let me keep talking i'm starting it huh i'm starting it oh you are i am it's already on yay so we are at i'm the unofficial self-appointed mayor of this Scottsdale Whole Foods. Oh, really? This is my first time here. What? Yep, absolutely. Oh, my God. i got to give you a tour. (laughs) Okay, so I'm with Anna Sanders. Anna Sparks. Anna Sparks. Yep. Are you calling her? Yep. Oh, that's why I got married two years ago, and now I'm Anna Sparks. Oh, and hence the name Spark Systems. You got it. Okay, so you have a bachelor's in exercise science? Exercise science for my undergrad, and my master's is in exercise physiology. Phys. Exercise phys. Okay. So I usually, I've been doing these interviews, I don't know if you've listened to them yet or not, but um, I get a, a background on everybody, just because it's cool to identify with where you came from, what what we'll end up talking about, and why it's important what you are doing and how we can learn from that um so where was the undergrad where are you from so so i'm actually from down south i hear it um, i hear it absolutely um i did my undergrad and my master's at ole miss the university of mississippi uh, are you from mississippi that's where i was born i was born actually in indianola mississippi but grew up in fayetteville arkansas wow so I call home Arkansas, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, did my undergrad and my master's at Ole Miss. Um, I played soccer at the University of Mississippi for uh, four years, and um, and then were you kicking ass? Absolutely. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. We were top twenty-five in the nation when I was there. But how about you? I mean, I I'll put up some photos or whatever because you're a little ripper. I mean, <laughs> just muscular, a little. 
right? Were you kicking ass? <laughs> um, I was. Um, what I love the most about being at Ole Miss and uh, being in the uh, Dexter Science Department was everything I was learning, I was able to apply to myself right away. And I was really into fitness, really into health. Um, but again, like I said, everything that was coming to me in school, I was able to apply to myself. Um, and so that was super enjoyable. But I never would have thought that I would have taken it to the extent um, that I have. Um, so my goal with my undergrad and my master's was that I wanted to coach. I wanted to coach. So soccer. how long, how early on did you know? Um, I knew right away. Yeah. So I, how long have you been competitive? Like. Um, I have, I've been asking everybody that. Like, where does the um, flip switch or the switch flip for everybody to, like, oh, that's uncomfortable. I don't want to run that hard. And then all of a sudden you actually, like, push it every single time. Well, so a little bit of uh, background. I've actually been very, very competitive my entire life. Um, I got into running, actually. I've always been a soccer player. But probably seventh grade I got into running. Um, and decided that I would do cross country because mm -hmm. cross country would get me in shape for soccer. It was kind but of. But you were still playing soccer mm -hmm, at the time. I was time. always playing right. soccer. Um, and actually, I was actually playing basketball and softball and running track and playing soccer. But soccer was always my passion. So your whole your family just mm -hmm. total rippers exercise all the time, huh? You know, um, my parents were just super supportive. Um, it wasn't that they were big time um, into sports themselves. Uh, but, yeah, my mom was athletic growing up. She was a big basketball player. My dad was into baseball. Um, but they just were there to support me. I mean, Just give you as much exposure to whatever you want? Whatever I wanted to do, then they would try to help me with every opportunity possible to be successful. Um, they both work full-time jobs. And so if I wanted to do something... I needed to go and find a route to get there. Like, if I couldn't drive. So yeah. if I wanted to play on a certain soccer team that was across town, then I had to go and introduce myself to someone that was on that team that maybe would be able to give me a ride to practice. Ah, um, now I see where the social aspect, you're yeah. super good at <laughs> connecting with people. That's a good early start for that, huh? Had to be crazy independent, mm -hmm. you know, because mom and dad, they, like I said, they were working all of the time super supportive but they my brother and i are big time independent because cool. of it yeah you had to learn how to do it on your own if you mm -hmm. wanted to get something done instead of blaming somebody else okay so soccer but you find the cross country start running yes. and um and i actually ended up being really good at the running um and i would say that you know i started getting letters from colleges uh freshman year um because in in track it's a bit different than soccer they have no idea how old you are all they know is your times um and so i was getting scholarship offers quite a lot actually huh. um when i was a freshman just because my times were so good i was actually um went out for the cross country team my freshman year of high school and won the state championship so were you, like, training specifically? Obviously, you know, different now. You were just running through uh, soccer and mm -hmm. using that on the run. That was it. That was it. And I just um, I picked up strategy quite quickly. Um, I knew there was a girl on the team that she had been the state champion. Um, she was a senior. And uh, so I learned a lot from her. And I knew that I was faster than her in if we had to sprint at the end. And so I would just sit behind her, just like we do in cycling, right? I would go. just draft off of her. And then at the end, I knew I could outkick her. And I would just go around and... and Take the uh, state championship. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yep. She awesome. ended up going to school on a full ride to run in college. Um, and then I continued on. And um, I Stuck remember... Stuck more with the soccer. Yeah, the yeah. soccer. I, I still would run uh, in high school, but my passion was always soccer. I loved playing soccer. What position were you? Um, I was a midfielder, mm -hmm. so I played. I played outside mid um, in college. Uh, when when I was in club, I would play either central midfielder or outside midfielder. Mm -hmm. So I could. I just had an engine. I could yeah, run all like day. It. Yeah, for sure. And then, okay, so so you guys were top in at Ole Miss. Yep. Uh huh. Yeah. Yep. How was that? You had a good team then, uh, obviously too. We did. We had a we had a great team. Um, 
it was just super fun atmosphere. Uh, being in the SEC is a very, very competitive conference. Um, we were very well taken care of. Um, and a lot they, of facilities to. Yeah. So then, when you said you were in <clears throat> school for exercise science, like you got to apply a lot of stuff right away. What were you applying right away that you were seeing in the books or in classes? What was that type of stuff? Yeah. So learning about um, about training principles, really about BO2 periodization, mm-hmm. and, and we we had to do a lot of case studies on. What's, um, what years is this? This was, let's see, I was a freshman in 99, and I actually graduated from college in three and a half years. So, um, sure. yeah, I finished in December of 2002, and then um, from there I moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, and I was a, um, I was actually dating a guy in Tulsa at the time, and so I moved there, graduated early, and um, after my senior year of soccer, soccer is a fall sport, so mm-hmm. after my senior season, I was done. Uh, with school and moved to Tulsa and I was because of the guy yeah because of the guy and um, I actually um, was a um, personal trainer at a gym in Tulsa and also was a high school soccer coach at a little preparatory school called Casha Hall Um, and it's so much fun gave me my first like real exposure to coaching Mm -hmm. um, and loved it and took the girls to the regional championship you know, um, this little yeah. little Catholic preparatory school. And um, and then I decided I wanted to go back for my master's. So I actually left Tulsa, went back to Ole Miss, um, and started my master's program in exercise physiology there. Um, but I also got an, in, um, an assistantship, a graduate assistantship in the weight room. I was big when I was, um, when I was getting my undergrad, I loved what we were doing in the weight room. And so when I went back for my master's, I applied for an assistantship to see if I could get my master's degree paid for yeah. um, and work in the weight room. So I did at Ole Miss. And I had uh, my teams were I had the linemen for football. <laughs> I had men's, <laughs> men's baseball. How big? How tall are you, by the way? <laughs> exactly. I, I'm, I'm real tall. Yeah. I'm 5'3 with my shoes on. Yeah. 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 I'm That's big so girl. awesome. They're like twice you. Yeah. More. And they would. We were talking about this last night, actually, while we were watching. Um, Georgia play and uh, I remember being in the weight room and whenever the guys would be doing their like they would have to max out so they'd have to do their one rep max um, the the strength coaches our jobs were to give them what's called heat so you slap them on their chest like right on their rib cage right and so they feel this burn and then they're not thinking about how hard it is to to bench right so you're just activating those those uh, nerves and those neurons and everything and so they would always go come on Anna give me some heat give me some heat and I'm like I will not hit you <laughs> that's so funny it's like so, you're riding a horse yeah these were big old boys I mean if you think about the linemen for a college football team I mean big old boys mm. and they would just pick me up one hand and move me so to you the got side. to do the structured training for them mm-hmm. And that was just based on the exercise science degree and, like, strength and conditioning principles and all that, huh? Yep, yep. How are they going? Pretty good? Oh, really good, Mm -hmm. really good. So we ended up going, let's see, um, we went to the Cotton Bowl that year. And um, so I'm on the sideline with the boys, and, you know, it was was great. I had a great time. I really enjoyed strength and conditioning. Mm -hmm. Um, And I felt like in the – while I was getting my master's degree, so I would do my intern, my strength and conditioning um, assistantship in the weight room from, I worked from 5 until 5.30, 5 a.m. to 5.30, and then I would go over and start my classes for my master's degree. They started at 5.45. Yeah. Um, and then I would work until, or go to class until about 9, 9.30. Um, and so everything I was learning in the classroom um, was about two years behind what we were actually implementing in the weight room. So in the weight room, we would just try things with athletes and we would track it and see, hey, did it work? You know, were we able to get a little bit more speed? Were we able to get a little bit more power? Um, How are you tracking it? And so basic, total old school, you know? I mean, you have to think like um, we had accelerometers that we would use with This them. is mid-2000s. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, and then, but you know just timing timing things um looking at when we were looking at strength stuff obviously what was their what was their one rep max you know going Mm -hmm. up to 
Um, so it was super interesting, though, that, that dynamic of I felt like everything in the classroom was about two years behind what we were doing in the weight room. We were just trying things in the weight room, yeah. you know. And here these scientists are like, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. We got to we gotta try to um, quantify. Quanti- we gotta, yeah, we got to measure this stuff, you know. So. so so you were there for two years for that master's? I was. I ended up, it was about a, a year and a half of actual coursework. And then the last semester was an internship. Um, and so that internship had to be in another weight room somewhere else in the country. And so it just so happened that the stars aligned and I went ahead and applied for some jobs. And one of those jobs was to be the soccer, the assistant soccer coach at the University of Arkansas. Um, and so I ended up getting the job. I had just turned 22 years wait, old. Wait, where is that? It's a Fayetteville. Fayetteville. Yep, Fayetteville, back Arkansas. to Fayetteville. So back home. Yep, and that yep. was part of the reason I got hired because mm-hmm. I knew the town. <clears throat> sure. I knew the clubs. I knew the system. I knew how to recruit, you know. Um, I had played. I had been part of the system for yeah, so yeah. many years. So I get hired on at the University of Arkansas. I've just turned 22. So I'm the youngest coach in the SEC. But I still have this semester left on my master's degree. And so I actually worked in the weight room at the University of Arkansas. Um, and my with, team's with who? With the women. I had women's gymnastics and I had women's golf. Um, and so Stacy so, Lewis wow. was one of my golfers. Stacy Lewis is one of the top golfers in the world, right? Um, and it was kind of going back um, when I think about Stacy, totally impact, you know, uh, the, the sport of golf for women. Um, but she has two metal rods in her back, hmm. right? And here in the weight room, we had to be very, very careful with everything we did with her because she was like, at that time, very delicate, you know? Um, and now to look at her, I mean, it's so cool how no she's doubt. just taken off. You set the foundation then. I got it. Mm-hmm. I like to feel like I was There you go. <laughs> so you were the youngest coach and finishing that semester there. Mm-hmm. What, what, how long were you there? So I was at Arkansas <clears throat> for four years. So my, my, um, the first semester that I was there actually coaching at Arkansas soccer, I would go into the weight room again, 5 a.m. I'd work with women's golf and women's gymnastics. And then about 8 a.m., I would head over to soccer, the soccer offices, and I would start my day um, with, with coaching, with being an assistant, assistant wow. soccer coach. I was there for four years, and then I took the job coaching at Arizona State. What's so that, what's that me, date? Oh, um, 08. 08? Yeah, so that moved me out here to Arizona. And why did you do that? Um, I had decided my plan was to be at Arkansas for three to five years as an assistant and then move to another university and be an assistant for another two to three years at a, at a um, I wouldn't say a bigger school, but, a, you know, another impact conference. And then after that, I would become a head coach oh, okay. at a, at a, a decent sized division one school, mm-hmm. um, you know, and being a female, having my master's degree and having that much experience under my belt, I felt like I would be, that was my path. And that's what I wanted to do. Um, I ended up getting to Arizona state and, um, had a great time, but I decided that I still wanted to be competitive myself. Yeah. What were you doing in the meantime? I mean, you were in the gym all the time. So, Did you work yeah. out with the girls? I was and, actually yeah. doing triathlon. <clears throat> oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So when I came, when I arrived at um, Arizona State, I had been doing triathlon, just um, Olympic distance stuff. Um, I had found a bike and um, borrowed a bike from someone and had started riding. Um, while I was getting my master's degree at at Ole Miss, my advisor, So what do you think? I mean, so you were doing a lot of strength and conditioning, a lot of power work, and then with... Um, the soccer just explosion left right backwards forwards um bursting type stuff how different was that for triathlon training because that's like steady state yeah totally different and Mm -hmm. plus i had so much mass on me you know too i was really big upper body you know um being you know as tall as i am at you know five five three of my shoes on being able to hold your own in the sec on the soccer field you had to be very very strong and Mm -hmm. so i probably was you know carrying quite a bit of mass muscle mass Mm -hmm. um and so transitioning into triathlon i mean you know on the bike 
you know, I had to lose that whole upper body. Um, and then also for swimming, I wasn't, I never swam before. So trying to learn how to swim. I always say that I was the hunter in all of these, uh, all of these triathlons because I was the, one of the last ones coming out of the water. And then I would get on the bike and I would just, you know, haul ass on the bike and make up. And I'm just picking people off, picking people off. And then you get me to the run and then I really accelerated, oh, yeah. you know. And so I ended up being actually quite good at triathlon. Um, but, you know, I was just so butt heavy in the water. I had no idea. I didn't swim as a kid. And so I never had the technique down, which yeah. I think you needed. So, oh, for sure. The right? Yeah. It was, this was just, this was an ITU no, it yeah. was just it was just Olympic distance. Like I went to um, I went to Worlds in Canada, like age group national or age group World Championships, um, and actually placed quite high there. Um, but then I, you know, once I came to ASU, I decided that I really needed to focus on job and what was going on and so I kind of took to cycling a little bit more because that's what I had time for mm-hmm. um, and just decided I still maybe I wanted to be competitive myself after that first year of coaching at ASU and that's where I I chose the bike okay and decided to start um, trying to get strong in the bike and and what did you I'm trying to think when we first crossed paths but um, so what did you that was 09. Yeah, that would have been... Because you got here in eight. Yeah, probably got on the bike and, oh, nine, probably closer to ten. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then was it, what was it, just local stuff or what were you doing? Yeah, I um, actually got picked up by um, um, Trisport okay. out of Tucson. They decided that they wanted to have a women's cycling team specific cycling team um and that they were going to give some money and put together a team and they were going to send this team to go race some of the um the nrc stuff and um i happened to get picked up i think i had done maybe like superior road race or a couple of races around here but nothing nothing big Mm -hmm. and um they were like hey would you like to come and race for our team and and i was like yeah so i did like that year i think i did tour the gila I did um, Cascade, I did um, Joe Martin, I did Redlands, I did all of these huge races. My, I mean, for me, it was. I'd never oh done, yeah, you don't have. I'd never done base. multiple yeah. multiple days before, and um, I kind of did quite well at mm-hmm. them. You know, I think I was twelfth GC at Redlands. You know, my first year, something like that. I mean, which was pretty good. It's awesome. And I didn't have a TT bike. Yeah. I didn't have anything. You know, um, I had some clip-on bars on my um, road bike. My road bike that was, uh, and I can't even remember what I was riding that first year. But anyway, it didn't matter. I was, I would go and I would cry all the time because it was so hard. <laughs> it was so hard every day. It was so hard. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm ever going to be good at something like this. But I'm going to keep trying. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to keep trying. <clears throat> um, and uh, and so I ended up getting um, picked up by um, FCS. Mm-hmm. Um, probably after I think maybe two years of being with TriSport. Um, and got called into the Olympic Training Center to go to that talent ID camp. And I was definitely the oldest one there. Um, and, yeah, and then FCS. I stayed with FCS for, let's see, I was with them for six years. Um, and I remember the first year. Because it changed and turned into? It's always been FCS. Oh, okay. Has been the, um, uh, the um, what do you call it, like the... That's what our team organization right, is. Right, right, right. But we've had different sponsors the sports group that have, that's that have come in. It. So, like, Visit Dallas mm-hmm. um, or Bea. So, but... Um, so, along that, so you were at ASU, but then when did you kind of step out of that role? Yeah, so it was probably 2010-ish. Yeah, that might be... I want to say 11 is when I we crossed, crossed mm-hmm. paths because I think you were working with Ben Stone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep, ben Stone, right. what's, he's like a PhD nutritionist. Yep, yep. What is it, Sigma? Uh, with Sigma Human Performance. Yep, mm-hmm. okay, I remember, it. yeah, and now I remember that's when yeah. we first crossed paths. Yeah. So um, so how did that come about? Well, so I was, um, I was at Joe Martin one weekend, and um, 
and my coach at the time, um, Scott Warren, uh, introduced me to Ben Stone at, and Ben is out of, was out of Little Rock, Arkansas at the time. And so Scott introduced me to Ben and Ben said, Hey Anna, you know, why don't you come back in town? I do some, uh, testing. I do some metabolic testing. Why don't you come down one weekend and I'll test you. Um, and then I'll go over your results with you and, and help you with any way I can. And I was like, Hey, that would be fantastic. And so seeing that I'm from Arkansas, I, but living out in Arizona, I flew home one weekend and I uh, was hanging out with mom and dad and I called Ben and I said, Hey, could I come down and get that test from you? He was like, absolutely. Come on. And after he went over all of the results, I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is exactly what my whole master's program was about. I love this stuff and I can apply all of this to my wait, training. Wait, wait. So let's just so that people who are listening here, what test did you get and what was it? Um, I mean, I know what it is, but uh, what was it saying and what did you, like, recognize out okay. of that? So, uh, Ben performed a, a metabolic test on mm. me. But with the metabolic test, um, he took me all the way to max. So, I was able to see my VO2 max as well. Mm-hmm. So, from a metabolic test, you get all of the, what your body is utilizing for fuel. Um, he's able to establish what your... Um, what we call your metabolic efficiency point is, you know, that crossover point when you crossover point when you go from fat burning, fat utilization to using a little bit more carbohydrate and just say, you know, car burning gas fuel versus diesel fuel that gives off different exhaust. Got it. And, you know, you have those masks on, you're either doing it on a treadmill or you're doing it on a bike and you're hooked up in that machine's measuring the gas exchange, mm-hmm. right? And then this gas exchange shows you what different fuels you're utilizing to get the specific effort level done. Mm-hmm. And so now you say, well, th- I guess we had this the whole time, but I was focused on soccer. I was fo- focused on power lifting, et cetera. And now, oh, this is what I was racing. This is what I was doing triathlon. This is the metabolic info underneath it all right so that excited you to see what that was absolutely absolutely Mm -hmm. you're spot on you know and then it tells you you know what are your heart rate training zones um and how do they change or how do they differ based on looking at something like that so when you're looking at a metabolic test and you're looking at that at that gas exchange you know you can tell at certain points when we're we're utilizing <clears throat> fat when we're at lower intensity so say your lower heart rate ideally zones, right? right yeah exactly and we'll go some into people, that yeah, yeah some people out there that are always utilizing carbohydrate or what we call your sugar burners and and what what influences that so i don't think people quite understand that because because yeah, so we will we will go into this but People that you might ride with, run with, hike with um, at the gym, they look aesthetically, you know, pretty damn good. But then when you hook them up to this test, it's like objective black and white data to show just how true that engine is running, right? Mm -hmm. So what have you learned and seen with these car burners and what's some of the issues? Well, so you, you hit the nail on the head in that fit doesn't always equal healthy, um, and from this test, really, the only true way to measure metabolism is by doing a metabolic test and looking at that gas exchange. Um, because the more dependent we are on sugar for fuel, or like what you said, what, um, what are the reasons why one would choose fat over sugar? Why their you know, body does, why right. Why their body does mm-hmm. that. It's because of two things. One is what they are, what their daily nutrition looks like. So what they're ingesting on a daily basis. And then also what their, what their training intensities are like. Now, granted, 75% of that is going to be determined by their daily nutrition. And 25% is going to be determined by their training. Okay? And I think a lot of people, especially a lot of athletes, have that flip-flopped where they would think that 25% would be based on their nutrition and mainly their nutrition while they're doing activity. Instead of their daily nutrition, what are they doing? If they're training two hours a day, what are they doing the other 22 hours of the day? What does their nutrition look like? Um, We. So what do you think um, helps people look at it that way? Like what do you think some of the things that are skewing people to look at it that way? Like... Well, mainly because we are 
already programmed that it's no pain, no gain. You know, you think if you if you train harder that you burn more calories, you know, that it's that it's all about calories in, calories out. So if I if I work out, I can I can eat this now because I'm gonna go and work out later and I'm gonna burn those calories off. But it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. That's not how metabolism works. Yeah. And and um <clears throat> Yeah, there's there's quite a bit of a paradigm with that, right? So you probably did, saw that yourself when you physically were training in the gym and playing soccer for ninety minute game, mm -hmm. but it was broken up. Is there a halftime or yeah, is so it, you yep. forty five minute halves? Okay, and now when you did the two hour plus um, triathlon and then the three hour road races, did you get to that point of glycogen depletion and and bonking? You know. Absolutely, but at the time, did I realize that that's what was going right, on? Right, that's what you I ended up thought, seeing with the metabolic right. numbers that you saw from Ben. And this is, I guess, what I'm I'm saying with that is, if somebody's working out 30 minutes to an hour in the gym, or going on a group ride for an hour, two at the most, they really don't get to that point where they've depleted it, and then they feel like they're getting away with what they're doing. Right. Okay. Right. And so then this is why I think it's important for people to understand what you guys offer to look at the objective data, just see where somebody's metabolic efficiency is. Because I look at it as a healthcare provider and say, you know, what are the implications of this long term? And what have you seen mm -hmm. for some of these people that are doing that? Oh, gosh. So let me just give you an example. Um, Three weeks ago, I had a, uh, a girl that came in that had just done Ironman Arizona. Super fit. I think that she went 10, 15. Very, Pretty very good. respectable time for Ironman. So, uh, so this is a girl. Is this a professional or is this somebody working full time? Blah, blah, so blah. So work. working, working full time. Okay. Um, and I, I believe she was 37 years old. So okay. quite young. Yep. Um, and I had her come in and she did a resting metabolic test, which a resting metabolic test is you just sit still in a chair um, can people do that absolutely oh, okay <laughs> sometimes sometimes so we have them um they come in they sit in the chair mask on their face collecting their expired gases and all they do is just sit there and just breathe normally all we ask is that they don't fall asleep and what we're going to determine is what their resting metabolic rate is okay so just when they are doing just how long brain, is it brain function you know typically they'll sit there for 15 minutes okay um sometimes they we go a little bit longer uh, than that so but a minimum of 15 minutes and as they're sitting there and we're collecting their expired gases, we're seeing just for brain function, just for daily normal activities, what they're utilizing for fuel. Are they trending more towards carbohydrate or are they trending more towards fat? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and this and are they fasted? Yes, they okay. are. Yes. So they... Minimum... You know, five hours or so. Okay. So we try to get it first thing in the morning if possible uh, for them to come in right when they wake up. Yep. And then I took her from the resting test into a bike test. Um, and she went through normal. How, wait, wait, how was she in the resting test? Okay, so in the resting test, I'm seeing that she is metabolizing sugar at a really, really high rate. So how, even at how much past the F, uh, Ironman was this? So this was, she was probably a month, four weeks. So she's pretty rested. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So she's metabolizing sugar at a pretty high rate during the resting test. And then we get on our bike. We take her through a metabolic test on her bike. Um, and actually, I ended up taking her all the way to VO2 because I wanted to see some of that performance. I wanted to see kind of where she was at. Um, and um, same thing. She was metabolizing sugar at such a rapid, rapid rate from the very lowest intensity. I'm talking very, very little resistance on the compu trainer taking her through this graded exercise test. Um, and she was using only sugar. And so I asked her, after she was finished with the test, I asked her to go and get some blood work done. Mm -hmm. And it came back that she was pre-diabetic. And so I had asked her, you know, I said, hey, um, what does your nutrition look like? You know, she's like, oh, well, I, you know, I, I eat pretty clean. And, and I'm like, but what, is, what does that mean? What, is, what does God. eating clean mean, you know? And, and, um, and she says, well, I eat a lot of, you know, fruit and, um, you know, and carbohydrate and, you know, and I'm like, okay, but you understand that, that you eat a lot of sugar. 
Um, and I said, and also tell me about what was your fueling plan like whenever you do go out and you do exercise? And she's like, well, I take a gel every 30 minutes whenever I'm out exercising. And I'm like, does that, do you do that whenever you are just doing an hour workout? She was like, absolutely. I'll have a gel before I start and I'll have a gel at 30 minutes, you know, and I always stick to that plan. And, um, and so it was just the lack of, you know, education. She is putting so much sugar into her body. Well, of course, she's now, putting all that sugar in her body. Her uh, body's going to go to that for fuel. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you're priming the system with those um, substrates. Mm -hmm. So did she come to you or you went to her? Well, she came to me. So she didn't have a coach before this. She was just doing it on her own. Mm -hmm. I think this is one of the things. I, I sort of knew this story, um, and I wanted to bring it up because uh, – so now she did a 10-hour event, and if she's burning primarily f carbohydrates throughout that whole thing, this is, let's say she, what, 6,000, 7,000 kilojoules in that 10 hours, something like that, probably height, weight, female, whatever, just to be able to get through there. And she probably took in 3,000 calories, 4,000 carbohydrates all in 10 hours. Yeah, all carbohydrates. It's so crazy. So then when um, somebody, like this is why... When people do one-hour rides, one-hour efforts, events, uh, two hours at the max, they really can't get through to the point of exposing this inefficiency. And to get the numbers that you guys give, I think, is so important so that you don't set yourself up for something like this because until she came f to you, she was just digging herself a hole and a hole, a hole, right? And there's so much out there that's available for us now it's like the information is just astounding to not let this stuff happen you Got know it. yeah and all we needed to do too is again go back to that 75 percent nutrition 25 percent training if we just changed her nutrition off the bike off the run her daily nutrition we can reverse this stuff we can get her back but, yeah, because you're giving it a knowing, rest. Yeah, yeah. She's thinking, I just did a 10, 15 Ironman. I am larger than life, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's a great, um, that's a great feat, you know, that she did. But at a cost, major cost, mm -hmm. major cost. I could give you fructose for four days in a row and make you pre diabetic, Eric. You. Right? I believe it. It's extreme. You can't physically exercise. At an extreme level for a very long time, musculoskeletal system can't handle it. C cardiovascular system is pretty damn good at catching up. But then you look at the metabolic system that you're testing or stressing with the high carbohydrate load, that's extreme as well. Oh. So have you ever seen, let's go to the opposite end of that, uh, ketogenic or no carbohydrates or low. Right. Like have you seen blowout or issues with that? Absolutely. So, um, you know, and ketogenic diets are very, very popular right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that for some people, if you aren't an athlete, going um, more towards a more fat adapted, not full keto, um, is probably going to show some, some health benefits. Um, but ketogenic diets are really hard to sustain. Um, so obviously, like you saw with this Ironman athlete, so is high carbohydrates. Right. I think this is what I want to get across with this particular topic is anytime you go to the extremes, even eating every two to four hours is mm -hmm. actually extreme, mm -hmm. right? You, you're literally only stressing that same system every single day and fasting on a regular basis only stresses one system every single day mm -hmm. and high carbohydrate only one system every single day so you and i know exercise fizz wise like use those stimuli and, and subsequent adaptations for a specific change and result that you're looking for and this is why it's cool to have somebody that knows what they're doing watch what you're doing mm -hmm. so what have you seen with the keto or the low carbohydrate intake so what we'll see is that people really struggle with um being educated on um on ketogenic diets and they typically will go more towards um higher protein um as well and um they don't really understand the role of the difference between the fat and the and the protein and they end up eating excessive amounts of protein which then if it's not being metabolized turns to sugar so right. it's just the same as them going and having 
carbohydrate, you know? Um, and so it's more of the lack of education and doing the extreme, just like you said. Instead, begin to start pulling out some of those refined grains and refined carbohydrates and those sugars. Start there, you know, start with that Baby change. Um, and also start looking at the timing, you know, of these nutrients. The timing, if you are going to eat those carbohydrates, two things. Think about the timing of them and the quality of them, okay? Um, getting sugar, keeping insulin quiet is going to be our goal all the time. Higher, higher quality of life is going to come from keeping insulin quiet. And if There's a lot of studies showing that it's not a, not a good thing to keep that insulin growth factor going. Yeah, and if you are constantly putting carbohydrate in, you're constantly having insulin going up. And what happens? Insulin causes insulin resistance. Yeah, because okay. it becomes the extreme. Cell, the cell can't take any more, can't take any more. Now, where's it going? All into your blood. And then, yeah, because yeah, there's no... Yeah. yeah, it's like you're trying to put another book in your locker and it's full. It's full. So it just sits in the hallway. Yeah. And then that creates an inflammatory response. Mm-hmm. And then you get... Uh, there's so many chain of reactions that happen through that. Oh, man, where was I going to go with this one? Because this is like such a huge topic for... But metabolism is essentially the key to unlocking your life, your quality of life. But if you don't know what your metabolism looks like, and if you aren't feeding yourself for your metabolism. Yeah, and so let's say even this Ironman athlete or somebody that wants to do a ketogenic, I don't think anybody, and I said this on another interview I don't think anybody's doing this to sabotage their health in the long run. Like, I think their genuinely in, intent is pure, but the application is poor mm-hmm. because they're misguided or they don't have time to look through things or they aren't seeing the signs. Well, they also, um, just because a ketogenic diet would work for you doesn't mean that it's going to work for me. Right. And that's probably the biggest thing that I have seen is that, um, because we did quite a lot of case studies on this too, um, to see if ketogenic diets would work for everybody, especially athletes. Um, and some people it worked really well and some people, and and those different, they needed a little bit more, they needed more of the carbohydrate. And that's not only on an individual basis, but also the sport and activity and lengths and intensity and everything. There's so many variables with these Mm -hmm. things. Jeepers creepers. So this is what, okay, so you and I, this is where I was going to go. So you and I, this is what I always think, like, how lucky are we even to think about, well, hmm, what time should I eat and what should the macronutrient, like, we're freaking lucky. But because we've got to race at the level we've done and burned all these calories and learned all this stuff, it's like being a Formula One car and bringing it down to like these commuter cars here and making them more effective and efficient and aerodynamic, right? So that's basically what I'm trying to do here is to show like, hey, we've worked it out at the physiologic limit. Now, here's what it looks like in the average Joe that's working, that has family. Um, What are you working on now? So let's go to the clinic that you're doing the regular Mm -hmm. metabolic testing Mm -hmm. for. Tell me that one. So what we're doing, we're trying to create metabolic efficiency across the board. Because this, not just with, it doesn't just, like metabolic efficiency doesn't just translate into performance, but it actually translates into a healthier individual as well. So then you can bring that to the mother who's taking care of kids and trying to work and the father who's uh, on the road. And like, you can monitor that stuff because you can objectively measure it right right because we essentially after we do a metabolic test we can tell you exactly how you need to fuel yourself for life you know for your individual and where are you doing it right now so right now we are in clinics um we are in five clinics in the valley um and actually growing um monthly right now um we also do so why are you growing why are we growing because people now are realizing um, that the information that we're able to provide them is so invaluable um, and that we're able to actually tell them um, and give them the tools to be successful. So people have been doing metabolic testing for 
years. But actually being able to take the data and put it into useful information, that's where they've been missing the boat. Right, because I remember 20, no, 17 years ago doing a VO2 test. Right. And... um, did anyone during that time tell you what you were utilizing for fuel? No. Nah. Right? I know, no. but the numbers were there. Right. Yeah, They've nobody. Been there. Yeah, so now you're you're finally getting people who have got the clinical ability to trickle it down and say, "Oh, what does this really mean?" So we're taking we're taking that data and we're able to actually create meal plans for people for their daily nutrition. Um, and actually telling them exactly what foods they need to be eating. And, and then, then you can hook them, them up again and you can say, hey, dude, I can tell you you're not following the plan because yep. here's the here's we'll the test. Yeah. So in the clinics right now, we, we test people every three months. Um, and um, So where are the people coming into the clinics? What's the story with all that? The thing is in the clinics, though, <clears throat> um, it is covered by most insurances if you have a diagnosis. And that's where um, I know what we will have the most impact is in the clinical side because of the insurance component of it. Because if people, if it's covered by their insurance, then they'll come in and they'll do the test. So their primary care doctor refers them over to us for testing. And the most, the majority of people we see are type 2 diabetics, obesity, hypertension, high cholesterol, asthmatics, COPD. Um, those patients that already have a diagnosis, right? Hold on, time out for a second. Because that's like, I remember reading some studies, 5% of the U.S. exercises on a daily basis. That's us, hey? Right? Right? So this is mostly who's going to be listening to Mm this. 70% or more is overweight and obese, okay? So 7 people out of 10 are basically the ones that you're testing Mm -hmm. and they're not exercising on a regular basis it's just crazy but the the healthcare costs are can be mitigated so easily by looking at this data that you're giving them so this is so right now insurance will cover it if you have a diagnosis but my goal is knowing that we actually want to be a preventative program. We want to be able to reach people before they get sick, before they have a diagnosis. So we want to educate them early on on the impact of daily nutrition, feeding themselves for their metabolism, and then also get providing them, combining that daily nutrition with the proper exercise intensities, just getting them moving. But knowing if they just adhere to the proper daily nutrition, that they're going to live a pretty high quality life. The exercise component, what does it do? It builds lean muscle mass. It provides them with a respiratory benefit because they're breathing more, which means they can um, combat stress and anxiety just by actually increasing their respiratory rate, Mm -hmm. which those are huge, right? But we know in the clinic, if we can just change one thing and we can get them to eat properly for their metabolism, that we can combat disease. We can reverse disease. And, and you've seen that in the type healthy. twos. Absolutely. Yeah. We are getting people <clears throat> off metformin every day um, across the board. Uh, and, and, and you can see it when, because if these people are coming in like that, then um, not everybody's as eager as maybe you and I are to right right so what so the ones do, that are eager are the ones that you're seeing the changes you got it and what we do is we we're educating them we have an hour that we spend with each patient and so we ask them why why do you get up every day what is your reasoning behind coming here and doing this program because we have to address that first and foremost or they're not going to adhere yeah. we're just wasting you know wasting our time um, and so we do. We give them a goal. When they first come in, we, we set a goal with them. And then they're coming in to see us again. And we let them know, hey, you're coming back in, you know, in three months' time. We want to see, here's the improvement we want to see. And we actually give them an attainable goal. If they adhere and they use the tools that we provided them from exercise, from nutrition, and from breathing, that they will definitely be able to a- achieve that goal. And then when they come back in in three months, we're going to continue progressing them along, you know? So this is cool because you're doing it in both settings. You're doing it for <clears throat> people that are, you know, having that diagnosis disease. And then you're doing it for those of us who want to stay, you know, ahead of the curve 
are offering it anyway because I, d- I don't think everybody gets tests like this because I don't think they really have gotten to sit down with somebody like you and go over like what what could you th- be potentially doing with yourself over the course of two decades of exercise even though you look good in the mirror and you're physically capable of going out and riding or running or whatever aerobic capacity you've developed um they're missing out on like actually the metabolic Mm -hmm. and biochemistry that could be getting over stressed as well. So one of the, one of the uh, phrases that someone said um, to me, or actually it was the Ironman um, lady. She said, I thought I could out ride a poor diet. Mm -hmm. I had no idea the impact. I thought as long as I kept exercising and I was hitting those numbers that I was fine. And that's where the misconception comes with these athletes. Yeah, and I would also even think, like, when you ask, like, hey, how was your nutrition? Like, even just the term nutrition in that case isn't even, it's certainly not nourishing. Mm -hmm. It's just literally keeping a blood sugar number a certain way, the way she was doing it. And that really doesn't do anything but stress that one system and little on the gut biome and all that stuff. Um so we spoke about really briefly, oh, it was about a month ago, hey, that you were working on something else as well. Are you able to, hold on, oh, are, were you able to, are you able to talk about that? Um, just doing Do, some, um, you know, just doing some work with um, some pregnant mothers, mm-hmm. um, which has been very, very interesting and in how we are utilizing, um, nutrition and exercise and breathing techniques in order to have an impact on, um, the fetus, um, inside the, inside the mothers. Um, and this little program that we have put together is something that, um, is, is really probably the one thing that needs to be addressed the most um when i come back to that that we don't want to just see people because they have diagnoses we want to look at prevention well what a better way to incorporate prevention than to when the fetus is actually in the womb um if we can address the mom's nutrition and her overall health and well-being then we have a direct impact on the fetus um in combating type 2 diabetes and combating metabolic syndrome yeah i would i would think i haven't even looked into this but as you're speaking about it there's got to be studies showing the exposure and the environment that the mother has and the likelihood of the the child having specific type of diseases based on what they're exposed to and then you're just saying hey here's the clinical data of this particular environment with this particular outcome of these children and hey we're and then obviously you know, once they leave the womb, it's they still have to live well too. Right, right. But this is giving them a better shot once they're out there. And two, once we get a hold of these moms, because moms are somewhat similar to an athlete in that they have this baby inside of them, they're pretty motivated. You know, um, whereas if you get someone who has already been diagnosed with you know um, type two diabetes and they are. 75 years old you know they're not exactly super mo- as motivated but you get a mom and you say to her hey how this baby turns out is all it's on you on you now yeah. you know and uh for the most part you hope that the moms are like okay I'm on at it. least for the next nine months you know like i've got an opportunity here i've got a job to do you know and i want to give my child the best chance possible well so are they coming to you or are you signing them up how's that working yeah they are they um we're working with um some some clinics yep um and uh they are they're coming they're coming to us but we're always looking for for more um and right now the program for the pregnant moms is cash pay unless again if the mom was diabetic um, or had high cholesterol, hypertension, any of those, di- she already had a diagnosis, then it would be covered by, it could be potentially covered by her insurance. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Man, sad, it's pretty awesome. sad to say though, right? Don't you wish that any mom would have this, you know, could come and it would be 
standard of care for them? Well, un- yes, I will say yes, but the only way that that happens is you keep up that good work you because it. then you show the results and both sides of it, cash or insurance, are going to see the results and want to be a part of that and offer it. So what's next? Are you racing anymore? Ah, I think I'm retired. Yeah? Yeah. You're a competitor, though. Something will happen. Yeah. You know, right now, just knowing how much of an impact this little program can have on the world... Um, is putting some focus giving there. me that um, I'm putting a lot of my energy there and mm-hmm. uh, growing this and, and seeing how far how far I can take it because I do believe that we have the cure, mm-hmm. you know, and people just need the information. You know, I feel like knowledge is power, and the more I can get out there and educate people on this stuff, the better. You know, we're just going to change lives. And right now it's one by one. And uh, doing things such as this, I appreciate the, the opportunity to yeah, be Yeah, no, because obviously I think it's important for people to know the metabolic efficiency, let them know what you're doing. Because most of the, like I said, this is the 5% or less that are working out all the time. And so we can go into the musculoskeletal part of it with what I do and say, hey, man, everybody's getting weak here. They're getting imbalances here. I don't want to sit here and talk about what I do all the time, but, like, I see the benefit of that. So then I see the benefit of what you're doing because you're saying, hey, this is this guy or gal is doing the same workouts that you are, and they ended up with, you know, pre-diabetes. Like, you should probably make sure you're not setting yourself for the same thing. Mm-hmm. Because there's this interesting paradigm or dynamic. And you say, oh, my God, Anna is so fit. What are you doing? Oh, you're riding a bike this many. I want to do that, right? But there's this, like, caveat with it where people will say, I love the exercise outdoors. I love pushing myself. I love going to the limit. But you know what? I just don't want to get that prediabetes, even though I'm doing the same thing that she's doing to get it, I just don't want the pre-diabetes, right? I don't want that part to come with it. Right. I don't want the disc herniation. I don't want the hip surgery. I don't want the knee tear. I like, But those are... They don't have to be one. Because you exercise, you get the pre-diabetes. Mm-hmm. Because you exercise, you, you have to look for those things that set you up for that failure point. And that's why I like to do these interviews is because there's so many people around me that have what it takes to guide us along this journey. Mm-hmm. You know, So we're not burnt out from do, doing something we love with the best intention. Well, I, I agree 100%. And, um, and so learning about your own individual metabolism... And letting us be there to provide you with the tools to be successful from exercise, nutrition, and breathing. Um, Check out our website at sparksystems.net and come in and get tested. We we test every single day. Yeah, and so let's say, I mean, because I look at some of the stats of who and what is listening to this, and they're all over Mm -hmm. this country, but even in other countries. So what would somebody outside of Scottsdale, Phoenix, the Valley, what would they be looking for in a facility? Like what kind of, so we call it a MET test, metabolic efficiency training. Yep. Training? You, yep, met, so, metabolic efficiency training. Yep. Mm-hmm. A MET test, <clears throat> What I mean, is there any other particular type of system or th- that would help describe or guide them if they were in Colorado, say, or if they were in another country? So they need to look for the, – the thing is is that there are a lot of places that offer metabolic testing, um, but the type of equipment that right. they use is um, a lot of times um, algorithm-based and not actually based off of your individual gas exchange. And so you've got to be a little bit savvy when going into some of these facilities that say that they offer metabolic testing um, because the equipment they're using – is not accurate and so you're getting false numbers which that's the reason you went is so that you can address these things and so um i would say if you any um facility that is at a university typically has has good equipment Mm -hmm. um and so going into an ex-phys lab um you'll probably be able to find someone exercise phys 
that that may um, be able to help you. And then also know that if you're able to get this data and that um, lab can't help you with utilizing the data, you can send us the data. Yeah, yeah. We'll help. We'll help you. We'll interpret. Yeah, it you need for to you. have somebody that understands how to walk you through the mm-hmm. the data and what the crossover point means and what it you know follow up like what is what happened what was good what was bad mm-hmm. right exactly yeah i just wanted it's to all just, about the interpretation because it's of those it's not the same it's never the same this whole foods is different than the one in phoenix mm-hmm. everything is different right so if somebody comes to a cairo that's different than me you know i got a little different approach than most but um <clears throat> anna thank you thank you eric yeah i appreciate your time. sparks um yeah, so I'll put up all the info to get a hold and shoot you guys emails or connect if they have questions. <clears throat> Hopefully people got something out of this one. I hope so. I really enjoyed the time. Nice See, what was inter- Yeah, yeah, for sure. So what was interesting is 2012, 2013, I did a MET test, mm-hmm. and <clears throat> it was pretty awesome. I should let you see it. But I didn't really... I just put to use what I understood about physiology, and it was pretty solid. Like the crossover point was pretty solid. So I knew what I was doing. When you see that visual and you're like, whoa, Mm -hmm. hold on. I can be doing, I can be doing a lot of things differently. And then you come back in and retest after you've applied some of the tools, Mm -hmm. you know, from you changed some, made some nutrition modifications, you've made some training modifications. And then you see that crossover point moving towards the right, you know, which indicates more metabolic efficiency. You're like, boom, yeah. I'm on it. And you feel so much. Oh, better. wait, wait. So, oh, this will be a little gem. So why is it more beneficial? Because how, how much uh, energy can you store a carbohydrate? Oh, gosh. Only about, about 13 to 1,500 grams of carbohydrate um, in how your many? liver and your muscle. Yeah. Um, and then fat, though, anywhere from 50,000 to 80,000 yeah grams of fat more than that some of these people <laughs> yeah depending upon your size but just think i mean it is the so how much is a pound food. of fat um, it's like 3500 yeah something yeah. like that and so then literally twice if not three times the same amount of carbohydrates you can go forever on your fat stores that's fat, so that's why you want to shift it and push it fat is a massive massive molecule <clears throat> you're gonna make it a little bit longer mm-hmm. so that's a little gem we should have put earlier in there but that's why you're looking at that crossover mm-hmm. point so okay thanks anna thank you okay sweet uh, anna sparks spark systems Awesome interview, really good in insight and uh, education and empowering, I think. Well, I picked some, a lot of these people for specific reasons because they can really educate us um, and have us get these check marks along the way so we're not running ourselves into the ground. So let's go give you a little bit of a background on, on that Ironman athlete that ended up being pre-diabetic. So it was, a at the time, 37-year-old female and she had been a recreational athlete for her entire life. And she she had done four Ironmans in the last couple of years. And um, at 32 years old is when she started to do the competitive triathlons like the um, sprint and Olympic distance. So, again, I think I said it during the, the talk where when you're doing those shorter ones where it's an hour or two, you don't really recognize because your body can catch up a little bit but when you start doing 10 hour or these really long events or taking your body to the limit for a long time this type of stuff starts to manifest because it's so extreme and so that's why I wanted to talk to Anna about what she does in the metabolic testing but also too if you can find uh, facilities in your area that could offer that um, testing, like she said, at like a, a university setting that has the adequate equipment, and then you can reach out to Anna and Spark Systems to interpret the data if they don't have somebody that can do that for you. So really cool stuff. I love what she's doing um, in the clinical setting as well, offering this for you know the, the general public and then helping guide them away from the diabetic uh, scenario, high blood pressure, atherosclerosis, etc. because you can track this objectively and you can measure them within a short amount of time and see if they're staying on track because those numbers don't lie. 
And then also, too, I really want to check back in with her on the pregnancy and helping um, these these mothers and the little ones that they're uh, during the, the nine months of um, pregnancy and buildup, like, how is that coming along? Is there, are, is there better outcomes and what are the things that you're measuring? So it'll be really sweet to see what they're able to affect and uh, give those babies a, a better chance when they when they are born. So again, thanks for listening to the OEM sessions. I hope you guys get some out of this. Remember to always like and share and shoot me some messages or comments and uh, give me some questions if you have them and I'll try to address them with somebody else or some way somehow okay hope hope this finds you well